This is Audible. Blackstone Audiobooks presents Man's Search for Meaning by Victor E. Frankel. The book bears a dedication to the memory of my mother. Preface Dr. Frankel, author psychiatrist, sometimes asks his patients who suffer from a multitude of torments, great and small, why do you not commit suicide? From their answers, he can often find the guideline for his psychotherapy. In one life, there is love for one's children to tie to. In another life, a talent to be used. In a third, perhaps only lingering memories worth preserving. To weave these slender threads of a broken life into a firm pattern of meaning and responsibility is the object and challenge of logotherapy, which is Dr. Frankel's own version of modern existential analysis. In this book, Dr. Frankel explains the experience which led to his discovery of logotherapy. As a long-time prisoner in bestial concentration camps, he found himself stripped to naked existence. His father, mother, brother, and his wife died in camps, or were sent to the gas ovens, so that, excepting for his sister, his entire family perished in these camps. How could he, every possession lost, every value destroyed, suffering from hunger, cold, and brutality, hourly expecting extermination, how could he find life worth preserving? A psychiatrist who personally has faced such extremity is a psychiatrist worth listening to. He, if anyone, should be able to view our human condition wisely and with compassion. Dr. Frankel's words have a profoundly honest ring, for they rest on experiences too deep for deception. What he has to say gains in prestige because of his present position on the medical faculty of the University in Vienna, and because of the renown of the logotherapy clinics that today are springing up in many lands, patterned on his own famous neurological polyclinic in Vienna. One cannot help but compare Viktor Frankl's approach to theory and therapy with the work of his predecessor, Sigmund Freud. Both physicians concern themselves primarily with the nature and cure of neuroses. Freud finds the root of these distressing disorders in the anxiety caused by conflicting and unconscious motives. Frankl distinguishes several forms of neurosis, and traces some of them, the noogenic neuroses, to the failure of the sufferer to find meaning and a sense of responsibility in his existence. Freud stresses frustration in the sexual life, Frankl frustration in the will to meaning. In Europe today, there is a marked turning away from Freud and a widespread embracing of existential analysis which takes several related forms, the school of logotherapy being one. It is characteristic of Frankl's tolerant outlook that he does not repudiate Freud, but builds gladly on his contributions. Nor does he quarrel with other forms of existential therapy, but welcomes kinship with them. The present narrative, brief though it is, is artfully constructed and gripping. On two occasions I have read it through at a single sitting, unable to break away from its spell. Somewhere beyond the midpoint of the story, Dr. Frankel introduces his own philosophy of logotherapy. He introduces it so gently into the continuing narrative that only after finishing the book does the reader realize that here is an essay of profound depth, and not just one more brutal tale of concentration camps. From this autobiographical fragment the reader learns much. He learns what a human being does when he suddenly realizes he has nothing to lose except his so ridiculously naked life. Frankel's description of the mixed flow of emotion and apathy is arresting. First, to the rescue comes a cold, detached curiosity concerning one's fate. Swiftly, too, come strategies to preserve the remnants of one's life, though the chances of surviving are slight. Hunger, humiliation, fear, and deep anger at injustice are rendered tolerable by closely guarded images of beloved persons, by religion, by a grim sense of humor, and even by glimpses of the healing beauties of nature, a tree or a sunset. But these moments of comfort do not establish the will to live unless they help the prisoner make larger sense out of his apparently senseless suffering. It is here that we encounter the central theme of existentialism. To live is to suffer. To survive is to find meaning in the suffering. 
If there is a purpose in life at all, there must be a purpose in suffering and in dying. But no man can tell another what this purpose is. Each must find out for himself, and must accept the responsibility that his answer prescribes. If he succeeds, he will continue to grow in spite of all indignities. Frankel is fond of quoting Nietzsche. He who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. In the concentration camp, every circumstance conspires to make the prisoner lose his hold. All the familiar goals in life are snatched away. What alone remains is the last of human freedoms, the ability to choose one's attitude in a given set of circumstances. This ultimate freedom, recognized by the ancient Stoics as well as by modern existentialists, takes on vivid significance in Frankel's story. The prisoners were only average men, but some at least, by choosing to be worthy of their suffering, proved man's capacity to rise above his outward fate. As a psychotherapist, the author, of course, wants to know how men can be helped to achieve this distinctively human capacity. How can one awaken in a patient the feeling that he is responsible to life for something, however grim his circumstances may be? Frankel gives us a moving account of one collective therapeutic session he held with his fellow prisoners. At the publisher's request, Dr. Frankel has added a statement of the basic tenets of logotherapy as well as a bibliography. Up to now, most of the publications of this third Viennese school of psychotherapy, the predecessors being the Freudian and Adlerian schools, have been chiefly in German. The reader will therefore welcome Dr. Frankel's supplement to his personal narrative. Unlike many European existentialists, Frankel is neither pessimistic nor anti-religious. On the contrary, for a writer who faces fully the ubiquity of suffering and the forces of evil, he takes a surprisingly hopeful view of man's capacity to transcend his predicament and discover an adequate guiding truth. I recommend this little book heartily, for it is a gem of dramatic narrative focused upon the deepest of human problems. It has literary and philosophical merit and provides a compelling introduction to the most significant psychological movement of our day. Gordon W. Allport Gordon W. Allport, formerly a professor of psychology at Harvard University, was one of the foremost writers and teachers in the field in this hemisphere. He was author of a large number of original works on psychology and was the editor of the Journal of Abnormal and Social Psychology. It is chiefly through the pioneering work of Professor Allport that Dr. Frankel's momentous theory was introduced to this country. Moreover, it is to his credit that the interest shown here in logotherapy is growing by leaps and bounds. Preface to the 1984 edition This book has now lived to see its 73rd printing in English, in addition to having been published in 19 other languages, and the English editions alone have sold almost two and a half million copies. These are the dry facts, and they may well be the reason why reporters of American newspapers, and particularly of American TV stations, more often than not start their interviews after listing these facts by exclaiming, Dr. Frankel, your book has become a true bestseller. How do you feel about such a success? Whereupon I react by reporting that in the first place I do not at all see in the bestseller status of my book so much an achievement and accomplishment on my part as an expression of the misery of our time. If hundreds of thousands of people reach out for a book whose very title promises to deal with the question of a meaning to life, it must be a question that burns under their fingernails. To be sure, something else may have contributed to the impact of the book. Its second theoretical part, logotherapy in a nutshell, boils down, as it were, to the lesson one may distill from the first part, the autobiographical account, experiences in a concentration camp. Whereas part one serves as the existential validation of my theories. Thus both parts mutually support their credibility. I had none of this in mind when I wrote the book in 1945, and I did so within nine successive days and with the firm determination that the book would be published anonymously. In fact, the first printing of the original German version does not show my name on the cover, though at the last moment, just before the book's initial publication, I did finally give in to my friends, 
who had urged me to let it be published with my name at least on the title page. At first, however, it had been written with the absolute conviction that, as an anonymous opus, it could never earn its author literary fame. I had wanted simply to convey to the reader by way of a concrete example that life holds a potential meaning under any conditions, even the most miserable ones. And I thought that if the point were demonstrated in a situation as extreme as that in a concentration camp, my book might gain a hearing. I therefore felt responsible for writing down what I had gone through, for I thought it might be helpful to people who are prone to despair. And so it is both strange and remarkable to me that, among some dozens of books I have authored, precisely this one, which I had intended to be published anonymously so that it could never build up any reputation on the part of the author, did become a success. Again and again I therefore admonish my students, both in Europe and in America, don't aim at success. The more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you're going to miss it. For success, like happiness, cannot be pursued. It must ensue, and it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself, or as the by-product of one's surrender to a person other than oneself. Happiness must happen, and the same holds for success. You have to let it happen by not caring about it. I want you to listen to what your conscience commands you to do, and go on to carry it out to the best of your knowledge. Then you will live to see that in the long run, in the long run, I say, success will follow you precisely because you had forgotten to think of it. Should the following text of this book, dear reader, give you a lesson to learn from Auschwitz, the foregoing text of its preface can give you a lesson to learn from an unintentional bestseller. As to this new edition, a chapter has been added in order to update the theoretical conclusions of the book. Drawn from a lecture I gave as the Honorary President of the Third World Congress of Logotherapy in the Auditorium Maximum of Regensburg University in West Germany, June 1983, it now forms the Postscript 1984 to this book, and is entitled The Case for a Tragic Optimism. The chapter addresses present-day concerns and how it is possible to say yes to life, in spite of all the tragic aspects of human existence. To hark back to its title, it is hoped that an optimism for our future may flow from the lesson learned from our tragic past. V.E.F. Vienna, 1983 Part 1 Experiences in a Concentration Camp This book does not claim to be an account of facts and events, but of personal experiences, experiences which millions of prisoners have suffered time and again. It is the inside story of a concentration camp told by one of its survivors. This tale is not concerned with the great horrors which have already been described often enough, though less often believed, but with the multitude of small torments. In other words, it will try to answer this question. How was everyday life in a concentration camp reflected in the mind of the average prisoner? Most of the events described here did not take place in the large and famous camps, but in the small ones where most of the real extermination took place. This story is not about the suffering and death of great heroes and martyrs, nor is it about the prominent capos, prisoners who acted as trustees having special privileges, or well-known prisoners. Thus it is not so much concerned with the sufferings of the mighty, but with the sacrifices, the crucifixion and the deaths of the great army of unknown and unrecorded victims. It was these common prisoners who bore no distinguishing marks on their sleeves whom the capos really despised. While these ordinary prisoners had little or nothing to eat, the capos were never hungry. In fact, many of the capos fared better in the camp than they had in their entire lives. Often they were harder on the prisoners than were the guards, and beat them more cruelly than the SS men did. These capos, of course, were chosen only from those prisoners whose characters promised to make them suitable for such procedures, and if they did not comply with what was expected of them, they were immediately demoted. They soon became much like the SS men and the camp wardens, and may be judged on a similar psychological basis. 
It is easy for the outsider to get the wrong conception of camp life, a conception mingled with sentiment and pity. Little does he know of the hard fight for existence which raged among the prisoners. This was an unrelenting struggle for daily bread and for life itself, for one's own sake or for that of a good friend. Let us take the case of a transport which was officially announced to transfer a certain number of prisoners to another camp, but it was a fairly safe guess that its final destination would be the gas chambers. A selection of sick or feeble prisoners incapable of work would be sent to one of the big central camps which were fitted with gas chambers and crematoriums. The selection process was the signal for a free fight among all the prisoners, or of group against group. All that mattered was that one's own name and that of one's friend were crossed off the list of victims, though everyone knew that for each man saved another victim had to be found. A definite number of prisoners had to go with each transport. It did not really matter which, since each of them was nothing but a number. On their admission to the camp, at least this was the method in Auschwitz, all their documents had been taken from them, together with their other possessions. Each prisoner, therefore, had had an opportunity to claim a fictitious name or profession, and for various reasons many did this. The authorities were interested only in the captives' numbers. These numbers were often tattooed on their skin, and also had to be sewn to a certain spot on the trousers, jacket, or coat. Any guard who wanted to make a charge against the prisoner just glanced at his number, and how we dreaded such glances. He never asked for his name. To return to the convoy about to depart, there was neither time nor desire to consider moral or ethical issues. Every man was controlled by one thought only, to keep himself alive for the family waiting for him at home, and to save his friends. With no hesitation, therefore, he would arrange for another prisoner, another number, to take his place in the transport. As I have already mentioned, the process of selecting capos was a negative one. Only the most brutal of the prisoners were chosen for this job, although there were some happy exceptions. But apart from the selection of capos, which was undertaken by the SS, there was a sort of self-selecting process going on the whole time among all of the prisoners. On the average, only those prisoners could keep alive who, after years of trekking from camp to camp, had lost all scruples in their fight for existence. They were prepared to use every means, honest and otherwise, even brutal force, theft, and betrayal of their friends, in order to save themselves. We who have come back, by the aid of many lucky chances or miracles, whatever one may choose to call them, we know. The best of us did not return. Many factual accounts about concentration camps are already on record. Here facts will be significant only as far as they are part of a man's experiences. It is the exact nature of these experiences that the following essay will attempt to describe. For those who have been inmates in a camp, it will attempt to explain their experiences in the light of present-day knowledge. And for those who have never been inside, it may help them to comprehend, and above all to understand, the experiences of that only too small percentage of prisoners who survived, and who now find life very difficult. These former prisoners often say, We dislike talking about our experiences. No explanations are needed for those who have been inside and the others will understand neither how we felt then, nor how we feel now. To attempt a methodical presentation of the subject is very difficult, as psychology requires a certain scientific detachment. But does a man who makes his observations while he himself is a prisoner possess the necessary detachment? Such detachment is granted to the outsider, but he is too far removed to make any statements of real value. Only the man inside knows. His judgments may not be objective. His evaluations may be out of proportion. This is inevitable. An attempt must be made to avoid any personal bias, and that is the real difficulty of a book of this kind. At times it will be necessary to have the courage to tell of very intimate experiences. I had intended to write this book anonymously, using my prison number only, but when the manuscript was completed I saw that, as an anonymous publication, it would lose half its value, and that I must have the courage to state my convictions openly. 
I therefore refrained from deleting any of the passages, in spite of an intense dislike of exhibitionism. I shall leave it to others to distill the contents of this book into dry theories. These might become a contribution to the psychology of prison life, which was investigated after the First World War, and which acquainted us with the syndrome of barbed wire sickness. We are indebted to the Second World War for enriching our knowledge of the psychopathology of the masses, if I may quote a variation of the well-known phrase and title of a book by Le Bon. For the war gave us the war of nerves, and it gave us the concentration camp. As this story is about my experiences as an ordinary prisoner, it is important that I mention, not without pride, that I was not employed as a psychiatrist in camp, or even as a doctor, except for the last few weeks. A few of my colleagues were lucky enough to be employed in poorly heated first aid posts, applying bandages made of scraps of waste paper. But I was number 119-104, and most of the time I was digging and laying tracks for railway lines. At one time my job was to dig a tunnel, without help, for a water main under a road. This feat did not go unrewarded. Just before Christmas 1944 I was presented with a gift of so-called premium coupons. These were issued by the construction firm to which we were practically sold as slaves. The firm paid the camp authorities a fixed price per day per prisoner. The coupons cost the firm fifty fennigs each, and could be exchanged for six cigarettes, often weeks later, although they sometimes lost their validity. I became the proud owner of a token worth twelve cigarettes. But more important, the cigarettes could be exchanged for twelve soups and twelve soups were often a very real respite from starvation. The privilege of actually smoking cigarettes was reserved for the capo, who had his assured quota of weekly coupons, or possibly for a prisoner who worked as a foreman in a warehouse or workshop and received a few cigarettes in exchange for doing dangerous jobs. The only exceptions to this were those who had lost the will to live and wanted to enjoy their last days. Thus, when we saw a comrade smoking his own cigarettes, we knew he had given up faith in his strength to carry on, and, once lost, the will to live seldom returned. When one examines the vast amount of material which has been amassed as the result of many prisoners' observations and experiences, three phases of the inmate's mental reactions to camp life become apparent the period following his admission, the period when he is well entrenched in camp routine, and the period following his release and liberation. The symptom that characterizes the first phase is shock. Under certain conditions, shock may even precede the prisoner's formal admission to the camp. I shall give as an example the circumstances of my own admission. Fifteen hundred persons had been traveling by train for several days and nights, there were eighty people in each coach. All had to lie on top of their luggage, the few remnants of their personal possessions. The carriages were so full that only the top parts of the windows were free to let in the grey of dawn. Everyone expected the train to head for some munitions factory in which we would be employed as forced labour. We did not know whether we were still in Silesia or already in Poland. The engine's whistle had an uncanny sound, like a cry for help sent out in commiseration for the unhappy load which it was destined to lead into perdition. Then the train shunted, obviously nearing a main station. Suddenly a cry broke from the ranks of the anxious passengers. There is a sign! Auschwitz! Everyone's heart missed a beat at that moment. Auschwitz. The very name stood for all that was horrible. Gas chambers. Crematoriums. Massacres. Slowly, almost hesitatingly, the train moved on, as if it wanted to spare its passengers the dreadful realization as long as possible. Auschwitz. With the progressive dawn, the outlines of an immense camp became visible. Long stretches of several rows of barbed wire fences, watchtowers, searchlights, and long columns of ragged human figures, grey in the greyness of dawn, trekking along the straight, desolate roads to what destination we did not know. There were isolated shouts and whistles of command. We did not know their meaning. 
My imagination led me to see gallows with people dangling on them. I was horrified, but this was just as well, because step by step we had to become accustomed to a terrible and immense horror. Eventually we moved into the station. The initial silence was interrupted by shouted commands. We were to hear those rough, shrill tones from then on over and over again in all the camps. Their sound was almost like the last cry of a victim, and yet there was a difference. It had a rasping hoarseness, as if it came from the throat of a man who had to keep shouting like that, a man who was being murdered again and again. The carriage doors were flung open, and a small detachment of prisoners stormed inside. They wore striped uniforms, their heads were shaved, but they looked well fed. They spoke in every possible European tongue, and all with a certain amount of humour, which sounded grotesque under the circumstances. Like a drowning man clutching a straw, my inborn optimism, which has often controlled my feelings even in the most desperate situations, clung to this thought. These prisoners look quite well. They seem to be in good spirits and even laugh. Who knows? I might manage to share their favourable position. In psychiatry there is a certain condition known as delusion of reprieve. The condemned man, immediately before his execution, gets the illusion that he might be reprieved at the very last minute. We too clung to shreds of hope, and believed to the last moment that it would not be so bad. Just the sight of the red cheeks and round faces of those prisoners was a great encouragement. Little did we know then that they formed a specially chosen elite, who for years had been the receiving squad for new transports as they rolled into the station day after day. They took charge of the new arrivals and their luggage, including scarce items and smuggled jewellery. Auschwitz must have been a strange spot in this Europe of the last years of the war. There must have been unique treasures of gold and silver, platinum and diamonds, not only in the huge storehouses, but also in the hands of the SS. Fifteen hundred captives were cooped up in a shed, built to accommodate probably two hundred at the most. We were cold and hungry, and there was not enough room for everyone to squat on the bare ground, let alone to lie down. One five-ounce piece of bread was our only food in four days. Yet I heard the senior prisoners in charge of the shed bargain with one member of the receiving party about a tie-pin made of platinum and diamonds. Most of the profits would eventually be traded for liquor, schnapps. I do not remember any more just how many thousands of marks were needed to purchase the quantity of schnapps required for a gay evening, but I do know that those long-term prisoners needed schnapps. Under such conditions, who could blame them for trying to dope themselves? There was another group of prisoners who got liquor supplied in almost unlimited quantities by the SS. These were the men who were employed in the gas chambers and crematoriums, and who knew very well that one day they would be relieved by a new shift of men, and that they would have to leave their enforced role of executioner and become victims themselves. Nearly everyone in our transport lived under the illusion that he would be reprieved, that everything would yet be well. We did not realize the meaning behind the scene that was to follow presently. We were told to leave our luggage in the train and to fall into two lines, women on one side, men on the other, in order to file past a senior SS officer. Surprisingly enough, I had the courage to hide my haversack under my coat. My line filed past the officer man by man. I realized that it would be dangerous if the officer spotted my bag. He would at least knock me down. I knew that from previous experience. Instinctively I straightened on approaching the officer so that he would not notice my heavy load. Then I was face to face with him. He was a tall man who looked slim and fit in his spotless uniform. What a contrast to us, who were untidy and grimy after our long journey. He had assumed an attitude of careless ease, supporting his right elbow with his left hand. His right hand was lifted, and with the forefinger of that hand he pointed very leisurely to the right or to the left. None of us had the slightest idea of the sinister meaning behind that little movement of a man's finger, pointing now to the right and now to the left, but far more frequently to the left. It was my turn. Somebody whispered to me that to be sent to the right side would mean work, 
the way to the left being for the sick and those incapable of work who would be sent to a special camp. I just waited for things to take their course, the first of many such times to come. My haversack weighed me down a bit to the left, but I made an effort to walk upright. The SS man looked me over, appeared to hesitate, then put both his hands on my shoulders. I tried very hard to look smart, and he turned my shoulders very slowly until I faced right, and I moved over to that side. The significance of the finger game was explained to us in the evening. It was the first selection, the first verdict made on our existence or non-existence. For the great majority of our transport, about ninety per cent, it meant death. Their sentence was carried out within the next few hours. Those who were sent to the left were marched from the station straight to the crematorium. This building, as I was told by someone who worked there, had the word bath written over its doors in several European languages. On entering, each prisoner was handed a piece of soap, and then— But mercifully I do not need to describe the events which followed. Many accounts have been written about this horror. We who were saved, the minority of our transport, found out the truth in the evening. I inquired from prisoners who had been there for some time where my colleague and friend P. had been sent. Was he sent to the left side? Yes, I replied. Then you can see him there, I was told. Where? A hand pointed to the chimney a few hundred yards off, which was sending a column of flame up into the grey sky of Poland. It dissolved into a sinister cloud of smoke. That's where your friend is, floating up to heaven, was the answer. But I still did not understand until the truth was explained to me in plain words. But I am telling things out of their turn. From a psychological point of view, we had a long, long way in front of us from the break of that dawn at the station until our first night's rest at the camp. Escorted by SS guards with loaded guns, we were made to run from the station, past electrically charged barbed wire, through the camp to the cleansing station. For those of us who had passed the first selection, this was a real bath. Again our illusion of reprieve found confirmation. The SS men seemed almost charming. Soon we found out their reason. They were nice to us as long as they saw watches on our wrists, and could persuade us in well-meaning tones to hand them over. Would we not have to hand over all our possessions anyway? And why should not that relatively nice person have the watch? Maybe one day he would do one a good turn. We waited in a shed, which seemed to be the anteroom to the disinfecting chamber. SS men appeared and spread out blankets, into which we had to throw all our possessions, all our watches and jewellery. There were still naive prisoners among us who asked, to the amusement of the more seasoned ones who were there as helpers, if they could not keep a wedding ring, a medal, or a good luck piece. No one could yet grasp the fact that everything would be taken away. I tried to take one of the old prisoners into my confidence. Approaching him furtively, I pointed to the roll of paper in the inner pocket of my coat and said, Look, this is the manuscript of a scientific book. I know what you will say, that I should be grateful to escape with my life, that that should be all I can expect of fate, but I cannot help myself. I must keep this manuscript at all costs. It contains my life's work. Do you understand that? Yes, he was beginning to understand. A grin spread slowly over his face, first piteous, then more amused, mocking, insulting, until he bellowed one word at me in answer to my question, a word that was ever present in the vocabulary of the camp inmates. Shit. At that moment I saw the plain truth, and did what marked the culminating point of the first phase of my psychological reaction. I struck out my whole former life. Suddenly there was a stir among my fellow travellers, who had been standing about with pale, frightened faces, helplessly debating. Again we heard the hoarsely shouted commands. We were driven with blows into the immediate anteroom of the bath. There we assembled around an SS man who waited until we had all arrived. Then he said, I will give you two minutes, and I shall time you by my watch. 
In these two minutes you will get fully undressed and drop everything on the floor where you are standing. You will take nothing with you except your shoes, your belt or suspenders, and possibly a truss. I am starting to count. Now! With unthinkable haste, people tore off their clothes. As the time grew shorter, they became increasingly nervous and pulled clumsily at their underwear, belts, and shoelaces. Then we heard the first sounds of whipping, leather straps beating down on naked bodies. Next, we were herded into another room to be shaved. Not only our heads were shorn, but not a hair was left on our entire bodies. Then on to the showers, where we lined up again. We hardly recognized each other, but with great relief some people noted that real water dripped from the sprays. While we were waiting for the shower, our nakedness was brought home to us. We really had nothing now except our bare bodies, even minus hair. All we possessed, literally, was our naked existence. What else remained for us as a material link with our former lives? For me there were my glasses and my belt. The latter I had to exchange later on for a piece of bread. There was an extra bit of excitement in store for the owners of trusses. In the evening the senior prisoner in charge of our hut welcomed us with a speech in which he gave us his word of honour that he would hang, personally, from that beam, he pointed to it, any person who had sown money or precious stones into his truss. Proudly he explained that as a senior inhabitant the camp laws entitled him to do so. Where our shoes were concerned, matters were not so simple. Although we were supposed to keep them, those who had fairly decent pairs had to give them up after all, and were given in exchange shoes that did not fit. In for real trouble were those prisoners who had followed the apparently well-meant advice, given in the anteroom, of the senior prisoners, and had shortened their jackboots by cutting the tops off, then smearing soap on the cut edges to hide the sabotage. The SS men seemed to have waited for just that. All suspected of this crime had to go into a small adjoining room. After a time we again heard the lashings of the strap and the screams of tortured men. This time it lasted for quite a while. Thus the illusions some of us still held were destroyed one by one, and then, quite unexpectedly, most of us were overcome by a grim sense of humour. We knew that we had nothing to lose except our so ridiculously naked lives. When the showers started to run, we all tried very hard to make fun, both about ourselves and about each other. After all, real water did flow from the sprays. Apart from that strange kind of humour, another sensation seized us. Curiosity. I have experienced this kind of curiosity before as a fundamental reaction towards certain strange circumstances. When my life was once endangered by a climbing accident, I felt only one sensation at the critical moment, curiosity. Curiosity as to whether I should come out of it alive or with a fractured skull or some other injuries. Cold curiosity predominated even in Auschwitz somehow detaching the mind from its surroundings, which came to be regarded with a kind of objectivity. At that time one cultivated this state of mind as a means of protection. We were anxious to know what would happen next, and what would be the consequence, for example, of our standing in the open air, in the chill of late autumn, stark naked, and still wet from the showers. In the next few days our curiosity evolved into surprise, surprise that we did not catch cold. There were many similar surprises in store for new arrivals. The medical men among us learned first of all, textbooks tell lies. Somewhere it is said that man cannot exist without sleep for more than a stated number of hours. Quite wrong. I had been convinced that there were certain things I just could not do. I could not sleep without this, or I could not live without that or the other. The first night in Auschwitz we slept in beds which were constructed in tears. On each tier, measuring about six and a half to eight feet, slept nine men, directly on the boards. Two blankets were shared by each nine men. We could, of course, lie only on our sides, crowded and huddled against each other, which had some advantages because of the bitter cold. Though it was forbidden to take shoes up to the bunks, some people did use them secretly as pillows, in spite of the fact that they were caked with mud. 
otherwise one's head had to rest on the crook of an almost dislocated arm. And yet sleep came, and brought oblivion and relief from pain for a few hours. I would like to mention a few similar surprises on how much we could endure. We were unable to clean our teeth, and yet in spite of that, and a severe vitamin deficiency, we had healthier gums than ever before. We had to wear the same shirts for half a year, until they had lost all appearance of being shirts. For days we were unable to wash, even partially because of frozen water pipes, and yet the sores and abrasions on hands which were dirty from work in the soil did not suppurate, that is, unless there was frostbite. Or, for instance, a light sleeper who used to be disturbed by the slightest noise in the next room now found himself lying pressed against a comrade who snored loudly a few inches from his ear, and yet slept quite soundly through the noise. If someone now asked of us the truth of Dostoevsky's statement that flatly defines man as a being who can get used to anything, we would reply, Yes, a man can get used to anything, but do not ask us how. But our psychological investigations have not taken us that far yet. Neither had we prisoners reached that point. We were still in the first phase of our psychological reactions. The thought of suicide was entertained by nearly everyone, if only for a brief time. It was born of the hopelessness of the situation, the constant danger of death looming over us daily and hourly, and the closeness of the deaths suffered by many of the others. From personal convictions which will be mentioned later, I made myself a firm promise on my first evening in camp that I would not run into the wire. This was a phrase used in camp to describe the most popular method of suicide, touching the electrically charged barbed wire fence. It was not entirely difficult for me to make this decision. There was little point in committing suicide, since, for the average inmate, Life expectation, calculating objectively and counting all likely chances, was very poor. He could not with any assurance expect to be among the small percentage of men who survived all the selections. The prisoner of Auschwitz, in the first phase of shock, did not fear death. Even the gas chambers lost their horrors for him after the first few days. After all, they spared him the act of committing suicide. Friends whom I have met later have told me that I was not one of those whom the shock of admission greatly depressed. I only smiled, and quite sincerely, when the following episode occurred the morning after our first night in Auschwitz. In spite of strict orders not to leave our blocks, a colleague of mine, who had arrived in Auschwitz several weeks previously, smuggled himself into our hut. He wanted to calm and comfort us and tell us a few things. He had become so thin that at first we did not recognize him. With a show of good humor and a devil-may-care attitude, he gave us a few hurried tips. Don't be afraid. Don't fear the selections. Dr. M., the SS medical chief, has a soft spot for doctors. This was wrong. My friend's kindly words were misleading. One prisoner, the doctor of a block of huts and a man of some sixty years, told me how he had entreated Dr. M. to let off his son— who was destined for gas. Dr. M. coldly refused. "'But one thing I beg of you,' he continued. "'Shave daily, if at all possible, even if you have to use a piece of glass to do it, even if you have to give your last piece of bread for it. You will look younger, and the scraping will make your cheeks look ruddier. If you want to stay alive, there is only one way. Look fit for work.' If you even limp because, let us say, you have a small blister on your heel and an SS man spots this, he will wave you aside, and the next day you are sure to be gassed. Do you know what we mean by a Muslim? A man who looks miserable, down and out, sick and emaciated, and who cannot manage hard physical labor any longer, that is a Muslim. Sooner or later, usually sooner, every Muslim goes to the gas chambers. Therefore remember, shave. Stand and walk smartly, then you need not be afraid of gas. All of you standing here, even if you have only been here twenty-four hours, you need not fear gas except, perhaps, you. And then he pointed to me and said, I hope you don't mind my telling you frankly. To the others he repeated, Of all of you he is the only one who must fear the next selection, so don't worry. And I smiled. I am now convinced that anyone in my place on that day 
would have done the same. I think it was Lessing who once said, There are things which must cause you to lose your reason, or you have none to lose. An abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal behavior. Even we psychiatrists expect the reactions of a man to an abnormal situation, such as being committed to an asylum, to be abnormal in proportion to the degree of his normality. The reaction of a man to his admission to a concentration camp also represents an abnormal state of mind, but judged objectively it is a normal and, as will be shown later, typical reaction to the given circumstances. These reactions, as I have described them, began to change in a few days. The prisoner passed from the first to the second phase, the phase of relative apathy in which he achieved a kind of emotional death. Apart from the already described reactions, the newly arrived prisoner experienced the tortures of other most painful emotions, all of which he tried to deaden. First of all, there was his boundless longing for his home and his family. This often could become so acute that he felt himself consumed by longing. Then there was disgust, disgust with all the ugliness which surrounded him, even in its mere external forms. Most of the prisoners were given a uniform of rags which would have made a scarecrow elegant by comparison. Between the huts in the camp lay pure filth, and the more one worked to clear it away, the more one had to come in contact with it. It was a favorite practice to detail a new arrival to a work group whose job was to clean the latrines and remove the sewage. If, as usually happened, some of the excrement splashed into his face during its transport over bumpy fields, any sign of disgust by the prisoner or any attempt to wipe off the filth would only be punished with a blow from a capo, and thus the mortification of normal reactions was hastened. At first the prisoner looked away if he saw the punishment parades of another group. He could not bear to see fellow prisoners marched up and down for hours in the mire, their movements directed by blows. Days or weeks later things changed. Early in the morning, when it was still dark, the prisoner stood in front of the gate with his detachment, ready to march. He heard a scream and saw how a comrade was knocked down, pulled to his feet again, and knocked down once more. And why? He was feverish, but had reported to sickbay at an improper time. He was being punished for this irregular attempt to be relieved of his duties. But the prisoner who had passed into the second state of his psychological reactions did not avert his eyes any more. By then his feelings were blunted, and he watched unmoved. Another example. He found himself waiting at sick bay, hoping to be granted two days of light work inside the camp because of injuries, or perhaps edema or fever. He stood unmoved while a twelve-year-old boy was carried in who had been forced to stand at attention for hours in the snow, or to work outside with bare feet because there were no shoes for him in the camp. His toes had become frostbitten and the doctor on duty picked off the black gangrenous stumps with tweezers, one by one. Disgust, horror, and pity are emotions that our spectator could not really feel any more. The sufferers, the dying and the dead, became such commonplace sights to him after a few weeks of camp life that they could not move him any more. I spent some time in a hut for typhus patients, who ran very high temperatures, and were often delirious, many of them moribund. After one of them had just died, I watched, without any emotional upset, the scene that followed, which was repeated over and over again with each death. One by one, the prisoners approached the still warm body. One grabbed the remains of a messy meal of potatoes. Another decided that the corpse's wooden shoes were an improvement on his own, and exchanged them. A third man did the same with a dead man's coat, and another was glad to be able to secure some, just imagine, genuine string. All this I watched with unconcern. Eventually I asked the nurse to remove the body. When he decided to do so, he took the corpse by its legs, allowing it to drop into the small corridor between the two rows of boards, which were the beds for the fifty typhus patients, and dragged it across the bumpy earthen floor toward the door. The two steps which led up into the open air always constituted a problem for us, since we were exhausted from a chronic lack of food. After a few months' stay in the camp, we could not walk up those steps, which were each about six inches high, 
without putting our hands on the door jams to pull ourselves up. The man with the corpse approached the steps. Wearily he dragged himself up, then the body, first the feet, then the trunk, and finally, with an uncanny rattling noise, the head of the corpse bumped up the two steps. My place was on the opposite side of the hut, next to the small, sole window which was built near the floor. While my cold hands clasped a bowl of hot soup from which I sipped greedily, I happened to look out the window. The corpse, which had just been removed, stared in at me with glazed eyes. Two hours before I had spoken to that man. Now I continued sipping my soup. If my lack of emotion had not surprised me from the standpoint of professional interest, I would not remember this incident now, because there was so little feeling involved in it. Apathy, the blunting of the emotions and the feeling that one could not care any more, were the symptoms arising during the second stage of the prisoner's psychological reactions, and which eventually made him insensitive to daily and hourly beatings. By means of this insensibility, the prisoner soon surrounded himself with a very necessary protective shell. Beatings occurred on the slightest provocation, sometimes for no reason at all. For example, bread was rationed out at our work site, and we had to line up for it. Once the man behind me stood off a little to one side, and that lack of symmetry displeased the SS guard. I did not know what was going on in the line behind me, nor in the mind of the SS guard, but suddenly I received two sharp blows on my head. Only then did I spot the guard at my side who was using his stick. At such a moment it is not the physical pain which hurts the most, and this applies to adults as much as to punished children, it is the mental agony caused by the injustice, the unreasonableness of it all. Strangely enough, a blow which does not even find its mark can, under certain circumstances, hurt more than one that finds its mark. Once I was standing on a railway track in a snowstorm. In spite of the weather, our party had to keep on working. I worked quite hard at mending the track with gravel, since that was the only way to keep warm. For only one moment I paused to get my breath and to lean on my shovel. Unfortunately, the guard turned around just then and thought I was loafing. The pain he caused me was not from any insults or any blows. That guard did not think it worth his while to say anything, not even a swear word to the ragged, emaciated figure standing before him, which probably reminded him only vaguely of a human form. Instead, he playfully picked up a stone and threw it at me. That, to me, seemed the way to attract the attention of a beast, to call a domestic animal back to its job, a creature with which you have so little in common that you do not even punish it. The most painful part of beatings is the insult which they imply. At one time we had to carry some long, heavy girders over icy tracks. If one man slipped, he endangered not only himself, but all the others who carried the same girder. An old friend of mine had a congenitally dislocated hip. He was glad to be capable of working in spite of it, since the physically disabled were almost certainly sent to death when a selection took place. He limped over the track with an especially heavy girder, and seemed about to fall and drag the others with him. As yet I was not carrying a girder, so I jumped to his assistance without stopping to think. I was immediately hit on the back, rudely reprimanded, and ordered to return to my place. A few minutes previously, the same guard who struck me had told us deprecatingly that we, pigs, lacked the spirit of comradeship. Another time, in a forest, with a temperature at two degrees Fahrenheit, we began to dig up the topsoil, which was frozen hard, in order to lay water pipes. By then I had grown rather weak physically. Along came a foreman with chubby, rosy cheeks. His face definitely reminded me of a pig's head. I noticed that he wore lovely warm gloves in that bitter cold. For a time he watched me silently. I felt that trouble was brewing, for in front of me lay the mound of earth which showed exactly how much I had dug. Then he began. You pig! I have been watching you the whole time. I'll teach you to work yet. Wait till you dig dirt with your teeth, you'll die like an animal. In two days I'll finish you off. You've never done a stroke of work in your life. What were you, swine? A businessman? I was past caring. 
but I had to take his threat of killing me seriously, so I straightened up and looked him directly in the eye. I was a doctor, a specialist. What? A doctor? I bet you got a lot of money out of people. As it happens, I did most of my work for no money at all in clinics for the poor. But now I had said too much. He threw himself on me and knocked me down, shouting like a madman. I can no longer remember what he shouted. I want to show with this apparently trivial story that there are moments when indignation can rouse even a seemingly hardened prisoner, indignation not about cruelty or pain, but about the insult connected with it. That time blood rushed to my head because I had to listen to a man judge my life who had so little idea of it, a man, I must confess, the following remark which I made to my fellow prisoners after the scene afforded me childish relief who looked so vulgar and brutal that the nurse in the outpatient ward in my hospital would not even have admitted him to the waiting-room. Fortunately, the capo in my working party was obligated to me. He had taken a liking to me because I listened to his love stories and matrimonial troubles, which he poured out during the long marches to our work site. I had made an impression on him with my diagnosis of his character and with my psychotherapeutic advice. After that he was grateful and this had already been of value to me. On several previous occasions he had reserved a place for me next to him in one of the first five rows of our detachment, which usually consisted of two hundred and eighty men. That favour was important. We had to line up early in the morning while it was still dark. Everybody was afraid of being late and of having to stand in the back rows. If men were required for an unpleasant and disliked job, the senior capo appeared and usually collected the men he needed from the back rows. These men had to march away to another, especially dreaded kind of work, under the command of strange guards. Occasionally the senior capo chose men from the first five rows just to catch those who tried to be clever. All protests and entreaties were silenced by a few well-aimed kicks, and the chosen victims were chased to the meeting place with shouts and blows. However, as long as my capo felt the need of pouring out his heart, this could not happen to me. I had a guaranteed place of honour next to him. But there was another advantage, too. Like nearly all the camp inmates, I was suffering from edema. My legs were so swollen and the skin on them so tightly stretched that I could barely bend my knees. I had to leave my shoes unlaced in order to make them fit my swollen feet. There would not have been space for socks, even if I had had any so my partly bare feet were always wet, and my shoes always full of snow. This, of course, caused frostbite and chillblains. Every single step became real torture. Clumps of ice formed on our shoes during our marches over snow-covered fields. Over and again men slipped, and those following behind stumbled on top of them. Then the column would stop for a moment, but not for long. One of the guards soon took action, and worked over the men with the butt of his rifle to make them get up quickly. The more to the front of the column you were, the less often you were disturbed by having to stop, and then to make up for lost time by running on your painful feet. I was very happy to be the personally appointed physician to his honour the capo, and to march in the first row at an even pace. As an additional payment for my services, I could be sure that as long as soup was being dealt out at lunchtime at our worksite, he would, when my turn came, dip the ladle right to the 